We speak of holding the violin, but the word hold is already misleading because when we think of holding an object, we think of holding onto it, holding fast onto it, not letting it escape. But that is a completely false conception of holding the violin. In holding the violin, we must not allow any such gripping to take place. It must be a matter of balance, of flexibility, and finally, when we apply effort or strength, it is only on the top, above the mastery of balance and flexibility, as we did with the bow. There is actually no fixed support for the violin, except when it lies on the collarbone. And no hold of the violin which must prevent its free motion, its adjustment to the stroke of the right hand, to the action of the fingers, to the sway of the body, to the sway and motion of the head, to the action of the shoulder. In fact, the first common faults are that not wanting it to drop, fearing lest it may fall, we want to put something underneath it. We want to put the shoulder underneath it, and of course, as this is not in balance, we clutch down with our heads to keep it from falling. And again, we hold on to it with our hands, or put our thumb underneath it. Th these are all wrong, because we must leave our shoulder free, and we must be well above the string so that we can move along the whole length of the fingerboard. We must have flexibility in all the joints. We must have freedom of the elbow. Perhaps little Karen, who has had almost no experience in holding the violin, might show us what the first reactions are. These are the difficulties. Karen is trying to hold the violin with her hands and she has no freedom that way. Her fingers are almost out of commission and touching each other. She couldn't possibly come way up the fingerboard in that position. Try to move up and down the fingerboard, Karen. You see, she has to move like an earthworm, one part after the other. There is um, no freedom there. The elbow is either leaning back on the side of the body or leaning out from the body instead of in and up. And of course, the hold of the violin under the chin is not quite right either. She has therefore no freedom of action on the violin and has no balance as yet. I'm sorry, Karen, to do sit down. I'm sorry to point out all your faults, but they are perfectly natural ones and should merely be corrected already at your stage of beginning. I don't usually play a plastic violin, but this may help to demonstrate the position. You will see better, at least through it. Now, the violin rests on the collarbone and the head rests lightly on the violin, free to move either from side to side or backwards and forwards. The reason for that is to leave the shoulder quite free. You can see how the shoulder can move that way. The other point of support is at the hand. Here you will notice how high the knuckles are pushed so as to leave plenty of space not only between the fingers as you can see but between the fingers and the fingerboard you will notice the, the space the rounded space within the hand between the inside of the hand and the fingerboard it is important that the violin should be supported and touched only with the fingertip and the soft pad of the thumb. You will also notice that the fingers rise almost vertically off the fingerboard and that the level of the knuckles from which the fingers fall is above the level of the fingerboard. You will also notice the space between the fingers. They should be trained to fall naturally equidistant from each other. And in this position 
the elbow is free to swing, the shoulder is independent, the fingers can rise well above the fingerboard, the space everywhere. Karen, perhaps you might show me your hold of the violin. That's very good. If you can increase even more the space between the root joint and the first finger base and keep that soft, free. That would be very good. Thank you, Karen. Now, to begin to find this hold, I think it is best to start with the violin hanging from the collarbone and the head and see if we can keep the shoulder free. At this point, everything is hanging and relaxed and the shoulder, as you will see, is not concerned with the support of the violin. It can be moved away, it can be quite independent of the violin. To raise the violin, let us put the thumb on one side of the neck and the second finger on the other, not all the way down because at this angle, with the hand closer to our body, it's easier to raise the violin and to hold it up. Now, as we raise the violin, you will see the thumb remains in, a, in its angle, right angle, vertically, and I lift my head to make room for the violin, for the new angle of the violin. I place the head back on again. All the while, as the violin has been coming up, we have been creating more and more room for the whole arm, which is now quite free. The violin is resting on the pad of the thumb, which is still nearly vertical. I'm not allowing the thumb to support the violin from below the neck, nor to fall into the crook between the fingers, nor do I bring up my shoulder to hold the violin, because then I would lose all the freedom I have been creating with the shoulder free. Perhaps an easier way to find the feel of the violin hold is with the help of a crutch, a ball or a hand. Rosemary, perhaps I might demonstrate on you. Now let me support the violin. Let the arm hang, first of all, right down. And now bring up your hand to playing position, not disturbing the softness in the arm, no responsibility in the shoulder. Put your third and fourth finger on the A and E string. Raise the knuckles well above the fingerboard. Keep this straight thumb a little more on the side of the neck. Go well into your root joint. Now I will gradually leave go and try to keep the same softness. That's very good. There was perhaps a little strain here. That's fine, Rosemary. Thank you. Now to achieve this position properly, we'll have to begin with exercises and we will begin with thumb exercises. This is a good exercise for the thumb joint, rolling it around the neck from its tip to its middle joint. Here's another exercise. If I lift my head and add a finger or two, doing the same motion with the thumb, I can rotate the violin between my thumb and fingers. Here is a further exercise which involves not only the thumb but allows the hand to rise with the elbow and the elbow swing. The thumb does almost the same motion as it did but as the hand rises it goes into the root of the thumb which you can see. This is the fourth thumb exercise, which is in a sense complementary to the last one you have seen. With the head very lightly resting on the chin rest, and the hand in its highest position above the fingerboard, right into the root of the thumb, we lift the violin by means of the thumb alone. Now, for the first time, 
let us move in the finger. I don't mean by that moving the finger up or down, off the string, along the string, up and down the fingerboard, vibrating, but merely letting the finger rest without pressing the string down, rest lightly on the string and move again as high as we can above that finger without changing the angle of the first joint of the finger, the joint that is next to the string. In doing this, we must also remember that we must create space, space inside this hollow between the violin and the arm. To do that, we must let the shoulder drop each time we raise the hand. The shoulder drops back. We must not allow the shoulder to join in the same direction of movement like that. That would paralyze us, but like we must do this. Here is Elizabeth doing the complementary exercise. Here the arm remains still while the violin is being raised by the action of the thumb. All the while, the angle of the first joint of the finger, the joint next to the string, remains constant. The object of this exercise is to increase the strength and the speed of the lift of the fingers and to avoid the clamping down of the fingers on the strings. We come to the important point, the great moment, of applying our pressure to the string. Pressure is again a misnomer because like hold, it implies a squeezing, but it is actually only the strengthening of the arch of the finger so that it may receive the weight, or a fraction rather, of the weight of the whole arm. In this feeling there is rather an extension, an expansion of space, with the shoulder relaxing, surrendering its weight, relaxing backwards, allowing the elbow to swing a little more around the violin so as again to bring more weight directly vertically over the fingertip. The fingertip must sit squarely over the string so that the string traverses the finger diagonally and so that some of the soft part, the soft part of the finger, rests equally on both sides of the string. There's no need to press the string more than this. In other words, the soft part need not be squeezed onto the fingerboard only as much as is required to carry the weight that will stop the string at that point so that it may vibrate clearly. The finger also must never pull the string to one side like that or push the string away to the other side. In other words, the weight must always fall directly, vertically, squarely on to the string. And this happens with its accompanying sensation in the shoulder and the elbow, as I described. Each time a finger comes down, even when it happens microscopically, and in any position on the fingerboard. In fact, a repeated, uh, a re the repeated falling of the finger is a very good preparatory exercise to the vibrato. Now that we have secured the finger to its point of contact on the fingerboard, we can begin using the horizontal swing parallel to the fingerboard and the strings. Here the first joint of the finger of course changes its angle from this folded to the almost flat as we do this exercise, you will notice how the motion goes from the fingers into the knuckles and indeed into the wrist. And we also 
feel arise as we pull the violin away as we move into the flat direction. At no time should the fingers touch each other, neither that way in the flat nor that way in the folded. Continuing the same horizontal motion, I would like to describe the involvement of the head and the shoulder. As we move our hand, pulling it away from our body, we are pulling the violin away from its hold between the collarbone and the head. The head, therefore, must allow its weight to fall and pull itself back, holding the violin, preventing it from sliding out. On the other hand, when we move the fingers toward the body, the head can be absolutely free of any responsibility. As to the shoulder, which remains quite free of the head, independent of the head, when we pull the violin away, its reaction is to fall back. When we push toward the body, its reaction is to come forward. This, however, does not occur simultaneously in a mechanical way like that. But rather, does the shoulder anticipate the hand making room for it? And it happens in a wave pattern. The movement of, of the shoulder is, of course, shared by the elbow, which also anticipates. Now we can resolve our three pairs of motions, the vertical, up and down, up and down, the horizontal with the fingers on one spot, backwards and forward, and the lateral swing of the whole arm into one three-dimensional circle involving every joint of the fingers, the hand, knuckles, wrists, elbow and indeed shoulder, first in the clockwise direction, and in the anti-clockwise. Now we have three exercises concerned with the reciprocal flexibility of the thumb and the fingers. In the first, the finger remains on its spot and the thumb is moved and in fact is helped being moved by the finger. In this exercise it does not matter if the root of the first finger is very lightly moving against the outside of the fingerboard. In the second exercise the thumb remains on its spot and the finger moves either in a palm smack bounce above the thumb or smack bouncing with the back of the hand below the thumb. This resolves into one action like that. In our third exercise, we are moving the thumb and the finger in opposite directions. We do this all the while we are keeping the lightest possible of holds both between the collarbone and the head, the chin that is, and the, on the other hand between the finger and the thumb. Now we come to an interesting motion, the lateral motion across the strings of the fingers. This is the plucking sound and is perhaps the oldest sound associated with stringed instruments. The harp and the lute, the guitar, even the harpsichord were plucked instruments. In this motion we see that the finger moves across the string. The first joint is always bent, depressed a little bit to get the purchase on the string. 
before releasing it. And the plucking itself that must not ignore the rest of the hand. As you see, there is a sympathetic motion even in the wrist. Now, this motion is possible in all positions, either when the hand is across the strings in this way, or when we bring the fourth finger over to the lowest string, to the G string. Here, as you see, the hand has to be higher, the knuckles have to be higher, in order to permit the finger to pluck the string than it is here. We must not forget that to play the violin, we must also be able to move the fingers horizontally along the length of the strings. This way, with each finger, always involving the cooperation of the joints, not only of the finger and the knuckles, but the wrist and the elbow, and in fact, the whole arm. We can also move two fingers simultaneously in opposite directions. However, when we move the second and third finger in opposite directions, between the anchors of the first and the fourth finger, there is much less whole arm or even wrist movement. The effort is concentrated more particularly in the fingers and the hand. There are a series of exercises, in fact, in several volumes, called The Independence of the Fingers by Dunis, a remarkable man who invented them, wherein each finger is required to do a different movement. Thus, assuming the third finger to be stationary, the fourth finger does a lateral movement, the second finger a plucking movement, while the first does a vertical movement. If the fourth finger is stationary, for instance, the third finger can do the lateral, the second finger the vertical, and the first finger the plucking. Perhaps if one of you tried to do this, you'd feel like the centipede who became paralyzed when he began to wonder which foot he should move first. In any case, we've gone about as far as we can with the left hand without hearing what the left hand is doing. But first we will have to learn how to move the bow on the strings, and that will be the subject of our next lesson.